Welcome to Squatch DTV, where the truth is first before all else. Join your hosts, veteran investigator, TV personality, and author Steve Coles, and from the Kentucky Bigfoot Research Project and the Kentucky Fried Fixes Channel, Chris Bennett. Sit back and prepare to take yourself on a journey with the longest running Bigfoot podcast, Squatch DTV. Here are your hosts, Steve and Chris. And good evening, cyberspace. Welcome to Squatch DTV for today's date, March 17th, 2024. Happy St. Patrick's Day. I'm your hey. host, your guide, the Squatch Detective Steve Calls, along with my co-host, Mr. Chris Bennett. Hey, Chris. Good to see you, Steve. Man, we've really been enjoying some nice weather here. I mean. Heck yeah. What a great day for St. Patrick's Day. Man. We had a little bit of rain. Supposedly, you're supposed to be getting snow tomorrow. Just flurries, I'm sure. Good, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's not going to get below freezing, so I don't understand why. But yeah. well, spring but, is here. I mean, we we've got 60s and 70 degree weather, and uh, all the the trees are budding out now, which is, you know, it's kind of got me in a rush to hurry up and get out and and get some more uh, footwork done before yeah. we have uh, a lot of foliage on the trees. That is correct. <laughs> that is correct. And uh, just so folks knew, I'm operating the show with a new browser tonight. So hopefully that will uh, uh, avoid some of the, the issues we've had. Uh, Chris already says my mic is sounding a thousand times better. Yeah, I so, think it sounds uh, much better, much clearer to me. On this but, end, it uh, sounds great. But, you know, for the last five years, we've been using Google Chrome for the show. And uh, it, it just seems like my computer is just always churning when Google Chrome is on and lately google chrome has been having so much issues loading different pages that for me it was time to switch yeah. and um so i switched to the opera browser although i'm still using chrome for certain things but the uh the opera browser is working really well well and, i'm gonna try that i'm, I'm yeah. gonna download it and try it because you know like i've been doing the same thing i've been using google yeah. chrome for years yeah. and uh, you know when you gotta kind of get complacent with something it's Maybe yeah, time to check out something new. But I'll tell you what, it switched over my 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 uh, saved sites. It switched over my my bookmarks, and it saved yeah. it switched over my passwords like that. Well, that's um, yeah. so it was like, wow, everything is just the way it was on there uh, on the on the uh, the Chrome. I'm like, not bad, and it's got a sidebar with a lot of little extra features, which I really love. So uh, you know, how's I don't the neck have... doing, man? Is it still crunching and popping? Absolutely. So to see me a little stiff tonight, yeah, that's, yeah. that's, uh, yeah, it's, it's there, you know, and, uh, until I get my MRI, they really can't work it to start repairing the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and frankly, uh, you know, it, I get, you never know when it's going to act up. I can be fine one minute, even when I'm on a muscle relaxer, or even ibuprofen, it can spasm at any time. And it'll just be like, oh, what did I do to, to deserve that? Yeah. Good, um, the change in yeah. the weather will, will will also make a big difference. Uh, yeah. It's bothering me now, but it is what it is. And sometimes mm. sitting, especially leaning forward, really bothers me. So I'm trying to keep proper posture. Oh, yeah. So I, I maybe I should put the book on my head. But anyway, it's time to do the roll call. Oh, all right. Yeah. And. 62 already golly guys <laughs> so yeah. we want to we want to welcome all the new uh listeners and uh yes. all the new uh subscribers welcome and uh hey guess who was in well i i know there were some folks in way early but tonight as far as the stream yard stream is concerned guess who was first in lester lester taylor congratulations lester this is becoming a habit now that's right. And if anybody wants to uh if anybody wants to hear the little tribute song we did to Lester, you can listen to the Bigfoot News uh, from last Friday. Yeah. Of course, Relic Common stopped in and said have a great show. He'll be watching tomorrow because he's over the pond. All right. And, Relic and we, got, we appreciate you. And of course, we got Sharon in the house, Daniel Weeks, Low Rider, Outback Orchard, Tennessee Cherokee, Pat Collins, Cherokee. Smedley okay. Dewright, Mitch Hargrove, Bristol, good to see you. Uncle Bones, too. Also good to see you. Pete H. Hello, Pete. Pete. 
Walter Kroll is in the house. Walter? Grasshopper, how you doing, Alan? Good to see Alan, you again. Don Gumow Jr., hello uh, from the state of Maine. So he's Mike's neighbor. Practically. Representing, yeah. Oh, pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Henry May, there's Henry May in Henry. the house as well. Good to see you, Henry. Uh, who else? Uh, Jeremiah, Bigfoot Society is in the house. Jeremiah. Who, with the battle cry, Joan, get me a Snapple. Yeah. <laughs> Traveling with Jim. Right. Jim, Jim, my buddy Jim. Good to see you, Jim. Yeah. R Robert Denduvin is in the house as well. Don Fuller. Okay. Hello, okay. Don. Don? Hey, Heather's channel. And Heather is from Scotland. She uh, dropped Heather. me a message earlier today. She usually oh. listens to the show oh, cool. and uh welcome heather good glad to see you could make it live tonight yeah. and it was a pleasure speaking with you today thank you for the kind words uh little kilroy still here little kilroy okay. finding the trackway hello bill well, I think, did you miss jen hey jen jen is in the, <laughs> did i miss jen i think you missed jen. oh i yeah. did hello jen sorry she's got such a little name it's hard to of course, we got Mike and Tactical Bigfoot Research in there. Right. Good to see you, Tom. Yeah. Tom Connolly, hello. Good to see you, Tom. I have, uh, I've got lost again. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, lost I'm, I'm still on. We okay. got a cryptic crystal in the house. Hello, cryptic crystal. Oh, Brian and Chewy go hiking in the house Brian. as well. Let's see. Alex Petikoff's in the house. Hello, Alex. Hello. Well, Another New Hampshire guy. New Hampshire's representing today. Yeah, they are. Glad to see it, too. We did say, Brian, that you we go hiking, yeah. and I... Right. Okay. So, Scott? Old Spirit Art. Hello, Art. Good Old to see Spirit. you. Good to see you. Welcome. Danny Staten in the house. Good to see you, Danny. Danny. Ah, there's Michael. Mike's in the house. Texas Bigfoot Rangers. Mike, welcome. Yeah. And again, thank you. And hello, Jeff. Thank you. I may feel like bleep, but you look and sound. And I research. Him. Welcome, Jeff. And uh, let's see, I think that's everybody. Oh, well, sandwich savant. I love oh, that. Sandwich I love it. Oh, man. DM Zabo in the house as well. Blake Burrows. Blake? Yeah, we got tea time with Tiffany. Hello, Tiffany. Tiffany, welcome. Oh, yeah. Man, that's... You're getting close to the bottom? Jay Fritz. There's Jay. Jay. Hi, Jay. Good All to see All right, you. we got everybody in the house. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm pleased... Especially pleased to see Henry May on here because uh, I love Henry and Henry uh, on his channel. He does a cryptozoology show. It's not just about Bigfoot. It's about other stuff too. And he usually posts once, maybe twice a week. So check out and Henry's you, channel, Henry and May. You, and you know what? You know who's due to come back on the show? Henry May. Henry, we want you back on the show. It's been a while. It's been a while. We need so to uh, I'm going to hit you up on Facebook. We'll get you scheduled out there. So I, I think the earliest spot we have is the middle of April now. We have shows. Of course, we don't have a show Easter Sunday. Michael. Oh, my God. Mike, what are you doing, man? Oh, my Thank God. You. I cannot believe this. I'm on a Thank fall you out of my so chair. much. I am. Goodness. Wow. Yeah, that's a big hello. Thank you, sir. <laughs> well, he oh said it once God. before. They do, every, they do everything big in Texas. Oh my God! Yeah, epidermally. Wow. Oh, Mike, I can't believe it. Thank you so much. Oh, um, I'm, 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 I'm for the cripple here. I'm <laughs> speechless now. <laughs> um, um, yeah, but that's how far we are booked out. We are booked out to mid-April already. So, uh, you know, I haven't booked the show in probably about three weeks. I've just kind of taken a vacation from that and doing and just switching into production. And uh, yeah, we have a whole bunch of shorts going out this week. Uh, we got one more from Haskell Hart. And then we go into our John Green shorts and our quotes from John Green. So, so anyway, we, we have a wonderful guest on, on tonight. 
he is from the, the Granite State, New Hampshire. And, uh, you know, somebody asked already, hey, is there Bigfoot on Mount Washington? Well, <laughs> you're going to have that opportunity to ask. Um, but uh, let, let me just give you a little background. Mike and I met at the Whitehall Bigfoot Festival. And him and his crew traveled out there to kind of film interviews and talk to people. And it, it was just such a good time. Mike is such an inviting guy. And, we, you know, it was like instant getting along with him. And, uh, you know, uh, so all of a sudden I notice here's this New Hampshire Bigfoot Society. And uh, guess who's kind of like front and center of it right now is Mike. So we said we got to get Mike on the show and we'll, we'll talk. And uh, so welcome, Mike. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Definitely a, a pleasure. It's great to meet you, Chris. Good to meet um, you. Hopefully we can do it in person someday. But um, yeah, definitely. This has been a blast. Um, a lot of fun since we first met in, in Whitehall. And I'll tell you what, Whitehall was an event in a day in itself. Um, that kind of that alone was just a great time. And and everything since then um, has kind of blown up and we've had a, had a lot of fun with it. Yeah. So let, I'll start by by throwing out some questions. Give us some of your background. I, I know you like you're, you have a very big production and video background. So. so that's so you know I also am a producer for uh, Chaos Theater Productions. Um, I, my son-in-law, we started a production company to do a lot of different things. Actually, um, we just is probably about a year ago we started it. Um, he does a lot of production for his nine to five and it was something that I've always wanted to do, but raising kids, you know, back in the day, I, back in the nineties, I wanted to go in early 2000s. I want to go to like, um, work for a radio station, get into broadcasting. And I realized that there was very little money into it. I would yeah. meet a lot of cool people, go to a lot of cool events and all that, but raising kids, um, it was kind of, <laughs> it wasn't going to work out. So it was always a, a little hobby. Um, and fast forward to now, um, I'm kind of semi-retired from landscaping um, because uh, 12 years ago, I got Lyme's disease, and it's just something that's kind of really kind of taken over on me. And, and that with some autoimmune conditions, um, yes, big guys fall apart quick. So shifting gears, and it's just timing works out to where my son-in-law, um, we've, we've had a lot of ideas where we... This, this is the one that actually kind of got the most traction at the moment. We have a lot of other stuff that we want to do, but paranormal and Bigfoot was a thing that we tried to, to kind of work on. We had a few people that were interested in kind of taking it by the reins. Um, and then, you know, as things got kind of closer, things develop a little different. So I just kind of decided to to take it myself and to, to run with it. And, yeah, going to Whitehall was – it was kind of funny because we were – thinking about doing the show, getting ready to kind of write some stuff up. And even if it was a cut and paste documentary type thing, just something to get out and, and do. And we ended up hooking up with Penford Media, who's out of North Adams, Mass. So they're really not that far from the New York area. I think they're more close to the Albany area than they are us, that's for sure. Um, and there were a couple of young guys that were going around to these Bigfoot festivals and talking to different people. And I, um, it, it, yeah, we, we got up there, we met with them and I wasn't sure what to expect. And Adam, Adam Malachuk killed it. Um, he's got a good way of, of, uh, talking with people and, and, uh, I decided to take some man on the street stuff and kind of run with it. And actually I, I did my homework at least to know who was the speakers were. And I saw Steve walk by and I said, Hey, Steve, <laughs> you, you got a few minutes. He's like, yeah, yeah I got like mm, maybe five, maybe yeah, it was really quick. So we kind of made the most yeah. of it. We had a lot of fun. Yeah. I am so super busy that I think you caught me just before I was supposed to do a presentation. Yes. I think that's what it was. And, uh, that event for me is so busy because I, I got my own station demand and I'm, uh, I'm doing that. And then I got, I got my, my, my lecture to go through. And then after that, I MC the calling contest. So it gets oh. very, very. <laughs> Mike said something there that interested me too. Uh, yeah, when he was talking about contracting Lyme disease, and that's mm -hmm. something that I think everybody that puts boots on the ground needs to be concerned well, with. Well, that's something that we want to talk about 
you know, and promote with the New Hampshire Bigfoot Society. We have some events coming up, local stuff. And my wife um, and I talked, and it's a great way to bring the community closer because no matter who's in the woods, whether you're hiking, swimming, fishing, hunting, looking for Bigfoot, um, especially here in the eastern oh. New England, and I'm sure you guys have it really bad in, in New York, but it's, it's, a, it's really bad. Um, Thank it, you, Walter. It's, Thank it's, you, Walter, it's, so much. It's really tough, um, you know, to keep people calm about it, too, because people come in the woods, uh, you know, come out of the woods and they, they're really freaking out, you know, and everyone's running to urgent care because they got a tick on them. It's like, slow down a little bit. So there's a lot of education. I think we can totally team up with some of this Bigfoot outreach and really kind of yeah. talk about some of the outdoor stuff that's really important to everybody. And I think well, that's Lyme something disease is... Is yeah, a big the, deal. The, the ticks concerned me, especially uh, well here in Kentucky. You know, I think you probably got a 50 50 chance. Some of them has it, some yeah, of them maybe yeah, not. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I found four of the little rascals on me from our outing we had last week. And, uh, you know, that's something to always worry about. Is there anything that you could recommend, Mike, or anything you other than maybe you know, Deep Woods Off or something? Yeah, you know, you definitely use the, the DEET um spray your stuff down i mean it's hard when you're hunting you know you, you, i mean i'm not sure maybe it's something steve can touch on uh, on later is you know how how well do sasquatches actually smell because i know like some animals and predators can smell a while and you know when i go deer hunting i try to make sure my 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 outer garments are dried out and eat outside all night you know to just kind of take that scent away um, and I like to kind of go in very stealthily and very quietly and hope to not give off a scent. So, I mean, if you squatch hunting, um, you know, some of that stuff is going to, I don't know, maybe give the scent away. At least that's my opinion. But otherwise, honestly, it's just staying super vigilant, identifying the ticks, because it's not all ticks that are going to give you um, Lyme's disease. And unfortunately, it is the really tiny ones that do. So you have to stay hyper vigilant on the, the moving freckles, as I call them, you know, uh, I'm pretty fair skinned myself. And um, sometimes after a hot day, you're dehydrated and nothing is, um, you've been in the woods or outside all day. And, um, you know, you, you, you don't look close enough because you're just, you know, tired. You just take your clothes off. You know, it's a good idea to check before you even go in your house. I'll do, I, usually if I go in the woods, I'll wear outer garments of, of some sort and strip those down. Um, even in the summertime, I'll make sure I have some kind of long pants on. Um, and just stay hyper vigilant. Um, I'd like to think that maybe garlic works. Just eating garlic would <laughs> would help, but that's kind of uh, goes back to the old vampire. And uh, well, yes, and, and, like and, 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 and when it does this, it also attracts a lot of Italians. Hey, hey do I smell like garlic? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and as an Italian, I can attest to that. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. But uh, you know, like, that, this is a, a topic that is very rarely discussed within the. Uh, realm of Bigfoot research is the dangers of the forest. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, yeah, scent blocking. You talked about scents, and yeah, you don't want to go in there with cologne or anything like that. Not necessarily because of the Sasquatch. The Sasquatch, if they smell something like that, not that if they're a primate. Their sense of smell isn't going to be that right. far. Sure. But they're going to be able to smell something and it may attract them actually. But the problem with a sweet smelling fragrance or anything like that or a soap will not only attract bugs, but it will also attract bears. It yeah. will attract animals that, like, hey, I smell something that's maybe food and right. that's what you want to avoid. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you want to kind of be scent free i mean i wouldn't go into trying to completely unmask yourself or anything like that if i'm doing but what you do want to do is make sure you're deeded up um and you, because you have to yeah, i mean yeah. and without a doubt that's just one of the one of the little bit and i always say always carry a safety blanket you know one of those aluminum blankets so you can in case you do get separated and you don't know where you are you can keep warm for the night yeah bring, bring a zippo lighter a windproof lighter that way if absolutely you, need to, you can start a fire uh and a i flash, always, uh, I always and a thought you know not to not to wear any kind of men's cologne over there because there's a there's a large female over in that one research area and i don't want to be her unwilling prom <laughs> date <laughs> wow wow 
Um, yeah, I, I think anybody going into wood should definitely have some sort of pack um, with basic survival gear, a knife, yeah. uh, maybe with a couple, or you know, even a a yeah. couple lighters, maybe even um, a magnesium and a flint, you know, yeah. block, you know, a couple different ways to start fire. Always go to your lighter first, right? Yeah. I keep them in almost every pocket so that they I cannot just never not have enough. Um, and don't yeah, they can get a, wet. Don't, yep, don't forget a flashlight. Yep. Yeah, that's a in fresh batteries. Oh, I mean, that's <laughs> kind of a thing. But some of the basic stuff, yeah, I think people need to just focus on because here in the White Mountains in New Hampshire, I'm in central New Hampshire. I'm just outside of Concord. So I kind of live on the edge of suburbia and vacation land uh, before we get into, uh, you know, the rugged wilderness of the White Mountains. Because between me and the White Mountains is uh, is pretty much like the Lakes region, Lakes Win Winnipesaukee, a lot of the, um, and you get out you know, a little further west toward Vermont, we get a lot of vacation, Ossipee, sun, well, Sunapee's out that way, and um, a lot of a lot of that stuff. But beyond that, it's just rugged, rugged wilderness. And I plan on doing a lot of stuff this year, kind of pushing myself because getting back to my, my condition, why I semi-retired from landscaping to begin with was because I was just so run down with arthritis. So this year feeling a lot better with new treatment. Um, I hope to get out and, you know, climb some mountains and talk to people in the field and do kind of a, you know, a, a man on a trail type, some segments for, for um, the project that we, we have coming up. So it's, nice. it's going to be fun and to get up there. Um, yeah. So we have, yeah, we, this, this <laughs> we have a lot of stuff going on and it's, it's so yeah. exciting. Uh, Mike, Mike Ann also said first aid kits are key. Yep. And in my, my gear listing, I have uh Benadryl cream. It's good to keep Benadryl tablets as well. Uh, you want to keep Pepto handy. Mm -hmm. You want to keep, of course, band-aids, bandages, uh, a triangular bandage. Um, I heard Chris. <laughs> Tackle tactician, yeah. Heard our English leather to attract yes. those big females. No, no. Um, and, and yeah, you want to, you want to, especially like the Benadryl cream. If you get a tick bite, okay, you pull the tick off. You can, you know, you can slap a little Benadryl cream on there. It'll kind of minimize some of that. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know that allergic reaction or that reaction you have to it. Um, the only time I ever had an issue with ticks was in Kentucky. Wow. And uh, you got I got them ready. I, I woke up in the morning and I went went to breakfast and saw, and there's Ron Bowles. What's that on your neck? And there was a tick on my neck. Oh, yeah. feel it. And he was like, pulled it off. And luckily he wasn't fat and nothing ever came of it. I found right. two other ticks on me uh, later that morning. And uh, they too did not give me any bullseye or anything other than just a little yeah. bump. Nothing a little Benadryl right. cream didn't fix. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, I and a snake bite kit. A snake bite kit is also crucial to have as well. I have found that if you have an, a tick that is attacked, get some isopropyl rubbing alcohol and pour some in the cap and just put it directly over the, the area where the tick is attached and just let him soak in alcohol for a little bit and he will detach himself. 99% of the time he'll come out by itself because... Well, yeah, that alcohol yeah. drives them crazy, man. They right. got to get away from that. Yeah, knowing my knowing my luck, I'd probably get the alcoholic kicked and want to stay there. Hey, more, <laughs> yeah, right? more, more. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's always a good idea, you know, to try to get those things off of you and watch, monitor your the skin area for that bullet wreck. You don't if you yeah, see that, so, get to a doctor. Get to the yeah, doctor. yeah, and that's it. Staying vigilant of the type of ticks that you're pulling off. Um, people can go, if, if they're worried, they can go usually and just get a shot or, or a doxy, doxycycline dose to uh, kind of flush it out or the potential of anything. Yeah. I'm getting back on like uh, skin <laughs> creams and stuff. I am the type of guy because I have landscape. So the other part of my background is is being, uh, you know, landscaping and being outdoors, um, working in nurseries. Um, and one of the other things I like to do is, you know, forage. So I'm an average forager. So instead of the Benadryl, I tend to chew up yarrow and um, find some jewelweed and some some of that wild stuff or that that stuff that's kind of growing. Sure. But it's it's not always it's not always available. But yeah, that stuff yeah. interests me too. Is a lot of that fun natural uh, sure. remedy stuff. Um, 
you know, I'll go out and filter water just to filter water for the <laughs> for now, the now fun of it, you know. Now, now you're sounding like my son. <laughs> Yeah, let me put this in my life straw. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll do something like I'll take a, a bandana, fill it with some peat moss, and you know, soak some water up out of a a pond, and hope, hope, and hope, right? Hope that the iodine and the peat moss purify <laughs> purifies it for me. But well, you know, it's, it's maybe it's, that's why I got you know got sick from being <laughs> from the it, lines. It's no stuff. shame to learn how to do those things and learn the wild edibles in your area before yeah, exactly. you go out. Because you know, maybe you're not going to go out and dig roots to eat and survive on. But if something happened and you oh, had absolutely, to, yep. you know, hey, mm -hmm. it's a good thing. Good to know. Um, it's it's fun to go in the woods too and kind of see a Walmart. If you kind of understand a lot of stuff, you start seeing uses for anything. Um, you know, getting hooked on the survival shows for one. Um, and then just going outside and really just kind of open your eyes. It's like, once you see one thing, you see another, I tend to go, when I go deer hunting, I end up coming home with a backpack full of, you know, wild mushrooms and I'll lay them on the kitchen countertop. It'll be pine needles and leaves and dirt stuck to them. And I'll chop them up and try to break them down and, you know, do some more research too. Right. Because you can only trust the phone app, you know, just for, so much, uh, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I'll get home and, go online and some, some, you know, field guides that I have. And, and then a lot of times I'll realize they're the wrong ones and just throw them all the way. And my wife will get pretty upset that I, I made a mess, you know, over, over kitchen, but um, that's, that's life. That's being a guy, right? That's just being a yeah. guy who likes being outdoors. And so that's kind of my background too, is just loving the outdoors. And when I, I got involved with the, the New Hampshire Bigfoot Society, um, and it's, it's founded by a friend of mine that I grew up with. His name's Kelly Porter. I'm going to give out a sh shout out to Kelly. Um, oh, Kelly is in chat, by the way. Is he? What's up, <laughs> yeah. bud? So him and I are literally lifelong. There he is. I'll, I'll do my best, bud. I'll do my best. Um, we're lifelong friends. And when we were kids, we'd run through the woods, you know, finding finding Bigfoot. And as we get older, you know, we kind of go our separate ways. Um, and kind of reconnected doing the Bigfoot thing. And, you know, it was a conversation um, with him that, yes, Chicken of the Woods is one of my favorites um, for sure. Um, you know, he's the one – I was really lighthearted, to be honest with you. Me and my wife were out driving around through the summer doing the state park thing, having fun. You know, we would go to the all the, the tourist traps and everything and – go on our own adventures and bigfoot is just an i is an iconic symbol that's t-shirts hats stickers you name it like i it's everywhere um yeah. and so it was always a fun thing but it was never anything that you know we took serious and it was uh me joking around with kelly one day um and he kind of gave me that side eye and uh <laughs> said mike make sure you know what you're talking about before you go run in your mouth you know, one of those things. And um, he set me straight on a few things. And he's the one that kind of pointed me toward Whitehall, too. You know, he's like, right. you know, go up there. I, You know, it's funny because we went up there. We expected to do a lot of stuff. And we never made it to the Skeensboro Museum. So that's going to be another adventure I'm going to have to um, set up because that's the place to go, right? I mean, that's kind of the the Mecca of Bigfoot in the Northeast. So right. Kelly kind of pointed me in that direction. And then since then him and I have worked together on setting up a festival, um, uh, planning, going to events um, as the New Hampshire Bigfoot Society and networking. You know, I've been busting yep. my ass uh, networking. We even kind of dabbled with, um, you know, rapid response investigation. And <laughs> I, I don't know that that went as well as it, it could have gone, but uh we we gave it a shot, and uh, we're going to take the back seat and and leave the investigations to the the pros for right now. But we're going to work on our skills, put our our team together, and see uh, you know how that that works out in the future. Because I did not realize how competitive or seems to be. I don't know. There's maybe you know, Steve. Maybe you can touch up on this. I didn't realize at first when I got into the Bigfoot community. I realized everybody was very open, very giving, and opening. 
But when you ask too many questions, it doesn't matter who it is or what they have to do with the community, whether it's an enthusiast, whether it's a, another investigator, people tend to clam up and get very defensive or very kind of quiet. And, and I kind of liken it to, um, you know, you, you got a big buck in your in your woods or you, you tell all your buddies at work about that big buck that's you're going to get them this year. But everybody asks you where it is. Oh, well, I'm not telling you my hunting spot. I mean, I can't, I can't do that. That's it's kind of a sin. So I'm almost feeling that's kind of the vibe that I get when I ask around or I, we start kind of going around and try to get a little more proactive with this. So, well, what, you know why that is? Yeah. Talk to me, Steve, please. <laughs> so why that is, is because you're new. Yeah. And I figured that right? too. I figured that <laughs> you too. know, over time, trust will build and that's huge. Like, and you know, to, to, to make a focus point, there was an investigation in New Hampshire that I had gotten thrown into as well as uh, crystal panic, who's been on the show and Alex Pedagoff and uh, out we went and Mike had been there the day before and another group apparently had been there the day after. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, you know, and my, Mike was very off put that, you know, that, well, the way it was kind of pressured to him, not by myself or any, any of us. Yeah, three, there was third and fourth but, parties that kind of, we all kind of, oh my, it was a, it was a head spin. Right. It was a, it was right. a tailwind that we didn't know right. what was coming. Right. And, um, uh, it, it, it happens. Um, the, the big thing is, is to like, I have certain research areas. And yes, people will clam up sometimes about where their research area is because um, I had that happen to me in 2013. I let sure. this guy know where my research area was. And then he went up there with his own team, not even telling me. It was because one of my own team members went up there for the weekend to do a little scout. Then he noticed that this guy was there. So what happens is, is sometimes people can deploy behaviors that will make uh, how should I say it? We'll make the creatures uncomfortable and make them vacate the area. Yeah. Uh, and that's why it gets really Ooh, sensitive wait. at times. Mm. You know, it, we, I look at that as my crime scene, as my experimentation area. Sure. Yeah, yeah. You know, now is, is it known? Yeah. There's people that know it. And sometimes people go up and believe it or not, when they do, they usually say, Hey, I was up at so-and-so this week and this is what I saw. So a lot of people that know it, I trust very well. Because I've gotten to know yeah, them yeah. over time and stuff like that. But you know, I, I think there's some, some credence to not allowing, you know, not spreading where you have a specific area at the the specific location because you don't know. I mean, you might have some guys go out there <laughs> and they're out there at night shining flashlights, right. shining, shining, shining. And there's a there's a few people in chat. I think there's like five or six of them right now that were there the day we caught the the Whitehall howl or the Fort Ann howl, I should say, uh, or the Fort Ann whoop. And, um, you know, I trust all those people implicitly. I don't care if they go up to that area. They, they know, you know, they know how we, we play things. They play very similar to I, that I do. And, you know, we, we've, I've talked to another, uh, gentleman that's close by that has this idea and I'm not so sure about it, but maybe we'll employ it. I don't know. We, we will see. Um, but, you know, the nice thing is, Mike, is that, you know, if you have any questions, you can reach out to Alex right there. I'm sure he'll. he'll yeah, uh, I have he'll not met Alex or uh, I think we might have crossed paths. I don't know if he was in Whitehall and, of course, in Henniker. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm sure in time. And you can always um, reach and you can always reach out to me as well. You got my uh, awesome. Yeah. And, and I appreciate that. So what we our next step actually is going to um, Portland, Maine for the International Cryptozoology Conference. I don't know Very if nice. you guys are planning on going up there, but uh, we're going to do some stuff with Penford Media and um, yeah, and represent. We're not doing like a booth or anything, but we're going to go and shake hands and see if we can kiss babies and make friends in Maine because the main people in Maine are really cool, low key, down to earth, and um, yes, yeah, it should be a lot of fun. It's going to be a lot. It's yeah. We have a lot of fun stuff planned and, and um, it should be a blast. But uh, let, let me just touch on, on that, that idea thing that the guy was respectful enough to ask me to say, Hey, what do you think if we do this? So I, I may just do it at a heck for the heck of it anyway. So um, what can it hurt? 
another but, few years of not having them in the area. I, I don't think that'll happen though, necessarily. I think it may, I think it's something they're used to, to tell you the truth, because in that particular area, the, the forest service, or I should say the uh, state NCON goes through and they cut up a bunch of trees uh, the same way. So they, they, they may not, they may be accustomed to it. So I don't know. Forest Service can be a uh, aggravation for research at times. <laughs> oh, by by the way, Lester, uh, the calling contest uh, is all in fun, and I don't judge it. I'm only the MC. I don't judge it. They they have a panel of celebrity judges. They pick either that or some of the people they either presenting or some of the town officials and stuff like that. And they'll usually they have one town person and a couple of people a uh, couple of researchers and they'll do the judging and it's just based on fun i mean it's not really based on accuracy or anything like that right yeah yeah it's, it's just fun um yeah we had actually penford media i think it's unheard is a series of documentaries that they put together based on the footage that we got and you'll hear a lot of howling and a, and a lot of the fun i think some of the banter with you and i steve and um yeah just a, a lot of the the festivities is, is so, uh, you know the funny the funniest thing i think that had happened which never made the video it's too bad we didn't have the outtake of that which we were talking and this old guy walks right in between us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and I just threw out a face. <laughs> I dropped this face. Like, I was like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was great. Yeah, then the kid was screaming. I think they, they ended up using that in one of the outtakes at the end of one of their uh, Penford Media Zach and Adam put it at the end of one of their bits, but um, yeah, the kid was screaming, and I just had a grin, and oh, then yeah, you yeah. couldn't retain, you couldn't get it back, and we had to just kind of go yeah, cold we're, face we're, and start we're, over again. We were just laughing. At me. <laughs> yeah, we have every, time. every time we'd start up, the kid would scream again. We'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, yeah, that cut that was a black. Like I said, I can't express how inspiring whitehall was and meeting you steve and, and being so open and just welcoming you know everybody was um the organizers at the event were totally cool letting us run around and and do our thing and um yeah so what we're doing in new hampshire um in october is we're going to try to do our own festival we got a piece of land uh, I'm going to try to set up some vendors, do a few things, um, maybe some music, um, see what we can do for local stuff. You know, I'm not going to really have a budget, but we're going to try to make the most of what we have. Um, and th that information will be coming out soon. we got a little more planning to do. Um, and yeah, because after Whitehall, like we, I got to bring some of that home. I got to bring it to the locals. Yeah. And here what I found in New Hampshire is that there's um, – and I don't know if I want to tell every you know the secret, but there's a there's there's a void. There's really like a demand for Bigfoot stuff here in New in Eastern New England or Northern New England rather, and um, it's just fun to see people from all walks of life just be really interested in Bigfoot, really interested in um, just everything about it, and it's it's. It's 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 I, I can't express just how much fun I'm having with this, and I, I learned a lot too. Bigfoot and um, one Bigfoot is different than other cryptids for a lot of reasons, and I think that's one thing that we want to talk about in my upcoming project, which is called Man Ape Among Us, um, that I'm producing with Matt Arsenal. He's going to direct it, and we we got a lot of it stuff. We just got to get a couple couple more things to put the first episode together. And what we plan on doing is creating a series based on one, well, it's kind of evolved now, but now it's, it's going to be based on our, um, our ride through this Bigfoot experience. And this is definitely part of it. This might be part of the wrap. This actually kind of brings us full circle from Whitehall, um, Steve. So I think me being here and talking with you is is kind of great, and it's even more inspiring that we're, we're here to do this. But what we want to do is kind of define where legend and myth and reality all kind of meet. Back yep. in 2001 in Danville, New Hampshire, a small town in Rockingham County, um, I, I 
grew up in a town, the small town next door. I, I literally lived in the, the other small town on the other side of it. And I worked in all those neighborhoods landscaping. There was sightings of, well, first there was weird howls at night in the woods. Um, and to give you an idea, it's probably only about 50 miles from Boston. So this is kind of the edge of, hmm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with New England, but um, we're, we're kind of the Merrimack Valley, what, it starts thinning out north of the Merrimack Valley, unless you go into New Hampshire, you got Manchester and Concord, which is pretty densely populated. But um, Danville is kind of that interior Rockingham where it's still small town, um, old school, um, uh, little almost village like, you know. So there was a lot of howling going on in the town, a lot of weird things kind of being reported, people not sure what they saw. And then one day, the police chief, uh, the fire chief, rather, David Kimball was driving his truck down the road. And um, what he said was an eight foot monkey jumped out of the wood line, ran alongside of his truck for a little bit, and then it darted back in. Um, I believe the initial report was that it was large. It had like a muzzle, a dog muzzle. So I'm thinking maybe like a baboon style uh, shaped face running on all fours. And, um, and then it, then it ditched in the woods and it was not, I don't think it was recorded again, but there was a lot of reports. So within the next few weeks, everybody in town started, you know, coming out with these reports that this crazy, this wild monkey thing um, was, was all over in, in the neighborhoods. Um, and it was all over the news. It was kind of cool. I think Howard Stern had talked about it that morning or one of the mornings, um, just kind of a brief thing. It, it started to get to the point where it was just one of those fun human interest stories that I think, uh, you know, ABC and NBC, they were all bringing media crews to town. The local radio stations were dressing up in, you know, monkey suits. Um, and then there was a whole other side of it where um people really concerned that there was a feral monkey or a loose pet or some sort of creature out in the woods that needed to be rescued because this was early September. Um, around here, it starts getting um, chilly around late September. So um, October 1st, all bets are off for outdoor survival. We could have a foot of snow or, you know, or we could have mild weather. That's just kind of how it is where we're at. And so it, it a lot of people, researchers came to town. Um, there's a lot of just the circus. It was kind of a lot of fun excitement around town. You know, we, we would be landscaping and working in a, in a neighborhood. And kind of the running joke was that, you know, the devil monkey was going to come out of the woods and get us. So it was a lot of fun until, and we were excited that, you know, we made the news and it was just one of those things. So it was going along great until 9-11 happened and then everybody forgot about it and it wasn't talked about much at all um and they the kind of went dead um doing some research i found a guy that i actually went to middle school and high school with that was a reporter for the manchester union leader at the time and he wrote some stories about it back in 2012 about another incident and more sightings so there was not only sightings in 2001 but 2012 there was sightings of a large monkey type creature um running through the woods um howling and creating a lot of uh a lot of havoc in a way i guess that's the legend is 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 that it created a lot of havoc and once the weather warms up a little bit around here um you know we're going to get out into the field and that's going to be you know one of the other episodes is to really focus on on that with our man ape among us um so mike is this going to be like a documentary uh i i think that? you know we're we're trying to you know it's it's a work in progress uh it, it'll probably be something different when it's done than, than we even dreamed. I think, I think it's going to be a little bit of documentary, a little bit of reality, um, some storytelling. We want to make sure that we get plenty of research coverage in it too. We want to do it justice. We don't want to do Bigfoot dirty by any means. Um, talking about the difference between what's biological and what's paranormal. I think for me, that's that defining that line is very important because we have real events these real events are Bigfoot sightings all over the Northeast, you know, and I have to focus on the Northeast because that's where I'm at and that's what I know. 
Um, I, I understand at least my neck of the woods anyway. I know the terrain might be a little different out over where you're at, Steve, but not much. Maybe just the rocks and the geology and the way that, you know. Oh, New, York, New York has a lot of slate. Not okay, granite. we're all granite. Yeah, we're right. granite and basalt over here. And um, well, yeah, it makes it a little different, a little different. I opened up a map of New Hampshire while you were talking a minute ago, and I noticed that there's a lot of waterways uh, in there, yep. uh, a lot yep. of lakes and a lot of a lot of yep. streams and rivers. Yeah, we're. Um, it was said that we're you know seventy percent um, or eighty percent woods and twenty percent water, um, but yeah, there's definitely a lo little ponds and lakes uh, everywhere. I mean, even my neighborhood. I drive a couple minutes down the road. I got like three lakes that there's houses and um you know communities on some of them are uninhabited some of them are full of people you know um and so we but we do have a lot of woods and they all connect um one of the spots here my my neighborhood is bearbrook state park which is the biggest state park in new hampshire i um, mean it is in uh merrimack county which is central new hampshire it's also the last place um to have a, a a living population of timber rattlesnakes um it's it's also a mysterious place where a lot of strange things have happened through the years um so it's one of those places too i think we're gonna do some checking checking out and do some investigation at least hone our skills out there right um get out there see what we want to do and how we want to do it because it's local and um if you guys are running short on rattlesnakes, just let me know. We can send you up a truckload. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're definitely not a common thing around here. I think I've only seen one poisonous snake in New Hampshire my whole life, and that was a copperhead. I went to catch it, and I realized, hey, that's uh, that's not that's not a garter snake, or yeah, or uh, we we do have the big brown water snakes, which get very very large, and people think they're water moccasins because um, they look so close, but it's fun when you catch one and people think it's a poisonous snake and they, you know, they chase them around the yard with it. Like I used to do that with my sisters, but I'll dig I'll, I'll digress with, with those stories. But yeah, um, it, it, it does startle you when you're walking. And also you see, Oh yeah. yeah. Eight, seven foot black corn snake going like, Oh yeah. Yeah. Caught, yeah. I caught one of those. Well, that's another one of the dangers of being out trekking in the woods. Right. You know, not only yeah. you got to worry about the little ticks and the little buddies that hang on you when you go home, but the, you got to, so worry about the, uh, the snakes. Yeah, in, in here in New Hampshire too. I'm, I'm sure, like uh, in you know Upper State New York, where you know you have less of that stuff. We do have the black flies and mosquitoes are probably the worst. Um, it's, well, let me let me give you a little geography lesson. Right, is that there is an area right across the river, the Poultney River in Vermont. It's a mountain. Uh, I forget the exact name of it, um, but it's near the Gaelic Preserve. And it has one of the largest concentration of rattlesnakes in the Northeast. Oh, wow. And uh, so, yeah, anytime you were down working in that area, it's very rocky and snakes love yeah, yeah. coiling up in, in between rocks. And uh, so it's, 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 yeah, it's a threat. But, you know, in all the years I've been up there, I've seen a water moccasin and I've seen a black corn snake and that's it. I've never seen a rattler, never even heard one yet. Yeah. And I've been in that area quite a bit. So there's supposed to be bear up there as well. I have yet, you know, even in my research area, other than the time Alex and I were, were there when we thermed a bear, that was the first time in <clears throat> 24 years I had seen a bear. Wow. You there. know, and that makes you wonder too, or makes you think, or, or should show, illustrate a point to people that are non-believers it's like of uh, you know people really see bears i mean when you're hunting i mean when I, if i go deer hunting I'm, i don't see deer every time i go out like or else it wouldn't be an issue so um bear a uh, very actually there's a there's a, definitely a, a resurgence of black bear here in new hampshire i had one in my i have a huge silver maple that's growing maybe 15 feet from my my back door and we had one, um, yeah, a juvenile or an adolescent kind of hanging out, checking it out, ready to climb down. And um, I had, you know, an elderly dog 
it wouldn't have been good if they mixed it up and my basement door was open. So the last thing I really wanted to do was have Ooh. a oh. <laughs> a black bear in the basement. Bear in the house. <laughs> and, um, you know, my wife and kids, and they, they all thought it was great and cool. Oh, look at the bear. He's so handsome. He's so nice. Yeah, well, we got to get him out of here. So I opened the door yeah. and I just yelled at him. And sure enough, he took off like a bolt yeah. backside of the tree and never seen again. Kind of felt bad that we yelled at him, but I, I didn't, you know, definitely didn't want to have to do anything else to him. And I didn't, as, as fun as it would have been to uh, be on like Northwoods Law when they were doing the uh, Northwoods Law up here, yep. Um, yep. I didn't really want to have to waste yeah. my day dealing with a, a bear and, in the basement, right. you know, so. Yeah, they, a lot of times they're, they're, they're kind of like a Bigfoot too. They don't want to, they don't want to see you as much as them. As no. you want to see one of them, no, no. Um, but uh, you know, and and I just checked a little statistic in that as of 2021, the bear estimate in New York State alone was six to eight thousand bear. Wow. And um, so, you know, and think about how rarely you do see those right, yeah. in New York. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's not like people. You know, usually when somebody sees a bear in New York, uh, you know, out like in the suburban areas, even. Right. There's a there's a news report on it. Yeah, oh, yeah, totally. But, yeah. But um you no. Know, and we've also had, you know, moose come through. I remember the moose running through the city of Troy. And then uh, a few years early before that, there was one running through Albany. And uh it happens. I almost had a few moose just a couple weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. Kind of ran out in front of us, like you know, I was driving down the road, and uh sure enough, the car in front of me had pulled over and, I, and it was kind of in a shadow spot too. Um yeah in the road and yeah sure enough another one came between us and you don't realize how big they are and how dangerous they are and then they're gone i got my i got my phone out quick because i was thinking squatch 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 you know stuff the whole time and how how fast can i react if i did see a squatch so i'm driving down the road pulling out my phone seeing if i could get a glimpse of the the moose and i did but um it was so it happened so quick, and you can only right. imagine seeing a squatch or, or something that just and it's here. Uh, you, and if you freeze or you get stunned, because uh, like I said, I haven't had an encounter. I've you know, we've all had, I think, uh, those eerie moments in the woods where things aren't right. Just last summer, my wife and I had climbed Mount Kearsage and just took a hike, um, and the woods were eerie, dead silent. Not even a cricket chirping, not even a songbird for hours. For it's hours. Weird. It is weird. It was unsettling. Um, and it was a great place for something like that to ha- hang out. You know, plenty of water, plenty of cover, plenty of um, resources. Um, but, you know, here's my interesting thing about that, though. You know, people say all of a sudden it got really silent. And I think something's going on. Well, you would think that a Bigfoot is a resident there. Mm-hmm. So nor- normally, I think a lot of times is they're reacting to us being me. Yeah, 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 you're right. I mean, I, I yeah. I've, I mean, because that that's true. I when I go deer hunting, I'll, it it takes a good half, forty five minutes an hour before you hear the squirrels running around chasing each other again. The hum, you know, the birds coming back. The you know, usually in a good hour, hour and a half of just sitting absolutely quiet, does the life start to come back? And then you'll see your deer or you'll see, you know, um, a fisher cat or something that's very unlikely. Um, I, I've i only heard about pine martins, but I saw one a couple of years ago just because <laughs> kind of was surprising because it was just an odd looking creature. And sure enough, uh, I looked it up and yeah, it was a pine martin probably chasing mm-hmm. the squirrels in my tree. I, you know, I in my years, some of the weirdest animals I've seen is I've seen an armadillo, and they sound like a tank coming through the woods. Um, literally, I mean, it's like crash, bang, boom, boom. You expect this big thing to come out, and here's this little, you know, just trucking away. Um, I've seen, I've seen a fisher in the wild. I've seen a mink in the wild. Uh, I have seen. Um, uh, um, 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 there's one other animal that I've seen that, that really. But it escapes me now. There's there's some out. You know what it is? Old timers again. So I'll probably have to I'll be like, oh yeah, that was. Um, but yeah, I I remember uh, uh, 
uh, so many, there's been some misidentifications. I remember going out to Illinois one time doing an investigation and there was a guy who said, you know, I could hear the Bigfoot snorting at me. And that led me to think snorting. Hmm, I don't hear too many Bigfoot reports where the big, Bigfoot snorts. Right. <laughs> I've been yeah, snorted at. That, that's, that's very true. I'm like, they do. They sound like calculated footsteps. <laughs> You're like sitting there going, is this a big foot? Is this a big foot? Yeah. No, armadillo. <laughs> yeah, let a turkey come up behind you while you're sitting out in the woods. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah we have a lot of turkey up here too. Oh, and that's it. I, I I had a barred owl fly over my head, like by about three feet. I think that's the cool thing, and what is really kind of opened my eyes or helped open my eyes to to come into a realization with the the Bigfoot thing is that, and I, I hate to call it a Bigfoot thing. It's a phenomenon. It's it's this thing, and I'm still trying to take it in and kind of grasp. So bear sure. with me. But um, when I grew up in the 80s, well, uh, you know, I was born in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So much land. I mean, we went through a period here in New Hampshire where it was really rough and run down. It was just old mill towns that were washed up and just dried up. All the shoe factories, um, all the Nikes and Timberlands that everybody's spending big money on, those were what we had for him. You know, that's our parents worked at the shoe factories at the textile places, you know, all that stuff dried up. And for a long time, um, it was kind of dead and kind of gross around here. A lot of clear cut land, a lot of pollution, a lot of just old. And when I got out of the army in 95, I joined the army right out of high school, actually while I was in high school, but well, thank you for your service. Absolutely. It was my honor. Um, I started landscaping and a lot of it was, re, you know, restoring properties, um, where, for, whether it was, you know, these open areas that were clear cut and just kind of left, you know, re reseeding them and restoring stuff. And, and I took a lot of pride in that with the landscape side of it. But since then there's been so much like reforestation and so much recovery that when I was a kid, we didn't see bald eagles. We didn't have loons here in Southern New, New Hampshire. Um, I saw, where was I? I don't think I was far from where I'm at. Maybe I was over in the Ossipee area, but I saw a golden eagle. I don't know if you've ever seen a golden eagle. It's massive, massive animal that was definitely not a turkey vulture. I mean, we got turkey vultures by, by the score, just flying in flocks all over the place constantly here. Um, but to see bald eagles and the loons and a lot of the birds as well as things like more fisher more black bear more moose especially here in southern new hampshire um it it makes me wonder and that's kind of why we went to whitehall was like is and that's what i think i asked you steve and i didn't know how to quite pose it at the time but like bigfoot populations are they something that was and i think you alluded to maybe they were here and it just maybe kind of more active or if they were migrating or whatever, because I'm thinking that this reforestation is maybe a drawer, at least providing more habitat for these creatures and other creatures that we haven't seen or were known to be extinct. We're also looking at mountain lions or catamounts as I'd like to call them as a cryptid, you know, um, also the old reports of certain um, of certain cryptids in the in the northern in you know old logging stories, the fearsome critters, for instance. You know, um, some of those cryptids from from hundreds of years ago turned out to be actual animals. You know, yeah. um, wolverines. They're not known to be living breeds populations around here, but they're so elusive and so scarce. It's it's not unreasonable to think wolverines and mountain lions are not coming through you know, my backyard. Um, and those go, and that kind of dovetails in with the, these real events, what people are seeing. Like you said, Steve, so many of these are misidentifications. Yeah. It doesn't mean they're not real. Right. I mean, how many times has somebody seen a Bigfoot and think, oh, it's just a man. Oh, it's just a hunter in a ghillie suit. That's a misidentification that literally flips the script and brings it the other way. So it has right. to, there's so many dots to connect that nobody can sit there without doing any homework whatsoever. And this is why I'm doing, trying to do what I'm doing, is you cannot just sit there and be a keyboard warrior and say, yeah, prove it, there's no body, right? You don't have a body, there's no proof. 
how, how can you be that lazy to just have that kind of explanation? That's just kind of right. Well, mailing it in, right? That's just being we, a, uh, uh, just being cynical to be cynical, right? I mean, and, and when you compare what's in the fossil record to certain animals, like it's amazing to learn that the Gigantopithecus, all we have is you know several jaw bones and teeth. Right. We don't have a vertebrae. We don't have a rib. We don't have a femur. We don't have any right. of it. We don't have a skull. But science says that's that we exist and that's real. Yeah. Right. And so I'm just saying there's so few bones of a creature that existed. You know, is it possible? That's the reason why we don't have the bones is right. because. Yeah. That, that would lead me up to a question, too. I was wanting to ask Mike about. I want to get your opinion, Mike, on. Whether you think uh, Bigfoot is strictly biological creature, or have you uh, heard or, or studied any any of the paranormal uh, applications into Bigfoot? So I haven't really dipped into the paranormal side of the Bigfoot thing. I have heard the story, you know, the portals. Um, you are, they, maybe they're guardians of the vortex. Uh, they come down and from the ufos they they're 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 a type of fairy i've heard a lot of these things um there's a lot to unpack um for a lot of reasons i i i think of bigfoot and i want to think of bigfoot and focus as the biological entity the wilderness i, I can relate i can relate to the wilderness from being a hunter and an avid outdoorsman um I understand, you know, plants and invasive species and all that stuff. So right. that's where my faith, and I think that's what it is with Bigfoot, right? With Sasquatch is a faith because you got to make that jump, right? And that's where a lot of atheists or a lot of don't talk about um, people's belief structure, but I think some people uh, are skeptical to take a leap of faith with the dots that are connected, you know, when we're trying to solve problems in life, right? A problem that is we've never done before. We're trying to overcome something or create something or whatever it is. And I'm sure Steve, you you're trying to be, a, you know, working as a content creator, you, you come up with problems all the time. You have to be creative to find your solutions. I think sometimes we have to take those educated guesses in those gut feelings and make that leap. And sometimes you're wrong. You know, sometimes you're going to fail and fall flat on your face as long as you can dust yourself off. All right, I won't do that again, you know, or I'll, I'll go a little harder next time or, or whatever. Um, I think some people in, the, in this thing seem to be missing the faith. And I think that's what I'm so excited about is that that faith and that hope. I think that's what brings a lot of people that see these things and don't know who to talk to or who to confide in because they don't want to feel crazy and look, you know, be judged. Um, you know, and two, you got to look at the people that are doing the judging. These are city people that don't know fresh air. If, if it hit them in the face, you know, people that are skeptical seem to be people that spend very little time in the wilderness, but anybody that lives in a rural community, anybody that lives uh, in an outdoor lifestyle will tell you that, yeah, there's more. There's more than meets the eye. Well, so as yeah. far as the paranormal, just to say, I I I know there's a distinction, but I also have a whole nother connection. I think some people are intuitive to certain things that I'm not, or at least I have a switch that I can flick it. I'm not pretending. I don't. I, I'm not definitely don't have any psychic abilities. I don't pretend to. I don't have that type of leap of faith so for me it's all about biological entities however i am intrigued by the stories and those connections of the the legends cryptids the paranormal and all those other stuff too but yeah i i, I think you know you kind of hit the nail on the head about faith i do not have faith that the creature exists i have faith in some of the witness accounts Right. I have faith in my own account, my own accounts. Yep. Um, it, it's really crucial that you go into everything, leaving that faith at the door, doorstep. You have to go in with an open mind 
willing to say this is either one of several things. It's a misidentification. It's a hoax. It's the real thing or it's something you're not going to be able to explain. Now, usually when it comes out, if you can't really prove it, but you believe in your witness, there's some corroborative evidence, but not scientific evidence per se. You can say, hey, this is likely this. You know, and that's a lot of what we deal with. It's likely, it's likely this or it's debunked. And a debunking can be several different reasons. Mm. I find it really hard that, um, but it happens. Um, but it usually happens when one of the senses is compromised. For example, I'll go back to that Illinois case where the guy heard the Bigfoot snort. We went out in the same field. We were a week behind his sighting. Week behind his sighting. And we're out there and we hear, <laughs> pull up a thermal. It's a buck. It was rut season. And we had kind of suspected that, but he had heard that. He heard him move in the brush and he heard these snorts, never hearing them before. Mm-hmm. Of course, yeah. he wasn't he wasn't a country guy. He yeah. was a city guy just hanging out in the country. And what do you know? It was a deer. Yeah. Um, so you gotta you gotta understand that okay, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. That's what we're here to find out and put all to rest. Well, that's interesting. Alex has put one. Uh, there's actually a report I heard years from the New Hampshire and Coos County of hunters who got scared off by a drunken Bigfoot near an apple orchard. Was well, story. now that's interesting. That does sound interesting because um, we are known for our uh, our beer intake up here in New Hampshire. So it's definitely not out of the realm of possibility that there's a local who's... Um, Likes to get a little groove on, especially a day like this, you know, St. Patty's well, Day. So let me uh, back to Dr. Jane Goodall. <laughs> yes, that's Chris knows exactly where yeah. I'm going with this because he's yeah. a studier of my books. But um, Dr. J- Jane Goodall, when she wrote in The Chimps and the Mugambi, he was habituating the chimpanzees with apples. And eventually there'd be some apples that were left on the ground. And, you know, she'd come back a few days later and try to do it again. But the chimpanzees, when they came out to see her, would take the apples they get and kind of put them down on the ground and take the apples that were sitting on the ground. Why? Because they had fermented. And they liked getting the buzz off eating these apples that were fermented. So when you say a a drunken Bigfoot near an apple orchard, it kind of rings a bell with a connotation of that story. And I didn't know if you knew that story. But I didn't know that story. Definitely yeah, not. So, so you see where I'm going. Hmm, there, there may be something to that. Now, here's another interesting point. That how many times have we heard stories of a Bigfoot smelling musk-like? Well, mm. the chemical that breaks down the apple and ferments them into alcohol is a substance known as ethol. And ethol, in its raw form, smells like musk. So I'm wondering if you have an apple that's uh, or a Bigfoot that's consuming a lot of those apples with that ethol, maybe that's where, where they emit a musky smell sometimes. Mm. Just a working, just a working theory based on some facts. Nothing proven, nothing sane, just an idea. See, I, I think that's what's fun too about this is that um, there's a lot of. A lot of stuff like I had an idea one day. It just kind of came to me watching a video that maybe um, tree knocks were chest thumps um, because gorillas were making a similar sound. It was repeated, you know, chest thumps. Um, but it got me thinking about it. And I, I, I shared it in a couple groups and to see what people thought. And it didn't seem to be that far fetched and i was actually yeah. kind of happy that <laughs> okay i'm on the right page here i'm on kind right, of there, trying there's another, here trying. there's another possibility that they do mouth pops right you know I, I can't do it with my mouth but you know sure and that's another working theory i don't know i i've heard tree knocks i had one a few years ago the last good tree knock i ever unprovoked we didn't even vocalize we just were walking and we heard one 48 degree weather so it couldn't be the tree expanding or contracting and we heard it boom and we're like and it sounded it definitely sounded like wood on wood but 
who knows at that point in time. And actually, uh, tactical, uh, Bigfoot research was with me when that occurred. And uh, it's nice to have these experiences. That's why I never go alone into the, the forest. I try not to. The reason being is, is that something happens. I want to have at least one witness to me that say, yep, this is what it happened. Or somebody that can keep me in check and say, no, that was not what you thought. Right. Yeah. And like what we talked about earlier is make sure you're safe and, and nothing happens to where you get a, you know, you're left in the woods by yourself. And, 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 and Mick, 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 that is true. They have apocrine glands underneath their arms that they will release an odor when they are under stress. I, uh, I, I, I like the apple thing because, uh, you know, being from Kentucky and have some working knowledge of alcoholic beverage production, <laughs> um, we, uh, we found out or I found out if you're making uh, homemade wine or mash for, uh, if you use apples, it has a really, really high alcohol content, really high. So a fermented apple, a rotting apple laying mm -hmm. underneath the tree somewhere would be a very uh, attractive thing to most oh, so primates. It, yeah, I would think so too. Um, I, I remember as a kid seeing a, a video on maybe, uh, you know, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Discovery or something back before cable. Or, oh, Wild or, Kingdom. Or Wild yes, Kingdom. yes, yes. Yeah. With, with Marlon Perkins. Watch, yes. Jim, <laughs> watch, watch Jim, the poor son of a gun. Jim. <laughs> Jim wrestling the alligator. Oh, there's Jim. He's getting beat up by the ostrich. Oh, there's Jim. Uh-oh. He just got kicked in the face by a mule. <laughs> but I remember yeah. seeing a... a, a a scene in, I think it was Northern Africa or maybe some where this orchard, all the animals from all around giraffes, um, elephants, uh, baboons, they would just come to these orchards after the, um, you know, the, the fruit fermented and they would just have a party. They were stumbling and drunk and I'll never forget that. So um, that's makes all the sense in the world to me. And if you think about it, there was a flap in the seventies in Whitehall on the northern side of Route 4. And at that time, there was an apple orchard on the northern side of Route 4. In 2006, those apple orchards were no longer there. Trees have been cut down, moved in for a little bit of industrial stuff. But now there was an apple orchard <coughs> on the south side of Route 4. And in 2006, there was a whole flap of sightings around that apple orchard. Yeah, you have the New York uh, the prison video that was filmed at an old apple orchard in the background. I was, you know, those were all apple trees in the background silhouetted. Um, and there are so many other examples of sightings near um, apple orchards. So, so those it, it valley starts. areas, those valley areas in, in um, the Hudson, was it Hudson river Valley? Um, yeah. I mean, that's a lot of orchard and farmland anyway, right? That's, but uh, if you go down towards like uh, the Plattic Hill area, the Ulster County, the um, uh, Ulster and across the river, I believe it's Duchess County. Um, you have a lot of apple orchards up in there. A lot. It's funny you keep saying Route 4, and I literally am on Route 4 right now over here in New Hampshire, U.S. Route yep. 4. So it's just, you're just down the street, I guess, yep, right? Yeah, just down the street. <laughs> right. <laughs> So it's not it's not a direct route, I guarantee. You. So it was a two and a half, three hours to Whitehall from here on well on Route Four. I think I cut up a little bit, but yeah, it's it's a know, bit of a drive. Yeah, a little bit, and there's nothing. There's really not much, and that's what I say about here when people ask where I live. Oh, you you near Boston or well, I'm, you know, we live kind of the north of civil the the northern edge of civilization, and there's not much north of us except for maybe Montreal and Santa Claus. Yeah, yeah, you're from way up in New Hampshire. Yeah, we're uh, well, yeah, right where I'm at. Yeah, I'm just outside of Concord, but that's like yeah. literally the edge. Everything yeah. south of us is suburbia. Everything north of us is just wilderness and, yep. and woods. So, so. Let's talk about uh, a little experience that we both can share a little bit. And I'm not going to uh, necessarily mention. Uh, well, hello, Boris. Good to see you, sir. First time making it to live chat. Howdy from Oregon. Welcome. <laughs> Boris, good to see Welcome. you. Welcome. 
I had to fly to see you, Boris. Um, there are times, and I think that was an eye opener for you. Um, when you start talking to a witness, and originally their story sounds pretty solid. Well, they have this video, it's questionable. They have another video, it's questionable. And then you meet them and you start talking to them and you realize, wait a minute, what, what's going on here? I think we both had that reaction in different ways. I think so too, yeah. And, um, and then comes the great debate. Was that person intentionally doing that or was the person of the mind that he was just maybe not, you know, all there? So it becomes that crucial point where you say to yourself, well, do I out this person? Because the person's just, you know, it's not, not no fault of his own, yeah. right? It's just the way his mind is working. Right. Or, or is it, you know, because he is intentionally trying to do that. I, and I believe that my decision is coming down to the latter, I actually believe. Um, and what convinced me was that the day after we were there, another group was there the day after. Mm -hmm. Right. So, well, you know, what's that, you know, in the, the, um, and I know if you had a similar thing, when you guys asked to be taken to where the, the scene of the crime was, the videos, did you get excuses or did you get, Oh, that's over there. Or did you get, you know, blow off or did he actually take you to where he said he did it? So yeah, actually it's funny because I was, so I showed up to this location um, on a whim kind of last minute um, hot tip. Next thing, you know, I'm getting reports that the whole Squatch community is over these reports and really excited about them. Um, so literally being 20 minutes down the road from where I, where I was, I'm like, okay, I can't kind of miss this opportunity. Sure. So we, I, I took a ride over there just, just for the heck of it, just to kind of put eyes in, on the ground and um, just to kind of take a look at this general area. And I didn't know whether I was ever going to get a chance to talk to this guy or this, yeah, this guy or not. Um, and we were kind of going through like a, some third person, um thing so it was kind of really weird for us um so yeah actually he came right to me um he found out i was there and he literally came to me and he said he was excited to meet me um and then when we started talking there was actually some things that really kind of made me wonder first off if the individual had followed me through social media had followed me through some of the stuff that i'd been active in because some of his descriptions were like for instance the the chest knocking thing he like i brought that up in a couple groups he had mentioned it and he kind of went into detail about that and it kind of blew my mind i'm like well this is like a working theory i have that's just very vague and very whatever and he's like feeding into it so right off the bat i got this kind of weird kind of step back like hmm I don't want to use the term, but is somebody tickling my uh, my fancy or are they trying to be relatable or how's this, you know, how, how's this kind of, how is this going to go? Um, and he was actually very open to kind of show us this general area where it was. It was rainy and it was getting dark. It was like a, a short, short window. We really had little to no time to do anything other than to talk to this guy. Um, and he showed me a few spots i couldn't get i only had my i didn't really go prepared with anything but a pair of binoculars um so i had my cell phone and i it actually loaded up with um with data so i didn't even have any cloud storage left at the moment maybe bad service or whatever it was so i i kind of stopped recording a couple things um but it was very unclear and then he was actually apologetic for even bringing me out there um, and then he explained stuff and some, some things that happened in the moment that, um, we tried to catch like motion at one point, it was, um, uh, my, my cohort across this kind of this flood plain on another tree line. Um, I was excited too, to be honest with you, you see a biped shadow moving across um, a tree line when you're looking for Bigfoot, you know, you get excited. 
Um, but when you realize it's, you know, it's the guy that you've known your whole life <laughs> and you can right, pick them right, out right, a million right. miles away. I'm like, okay, right. I, I know who that is. That's Kelly. That's not a Bigfoot. Um, but the guy with the witness was really, he's actually persistent about seeing something move. I had binoculars. He didn't. And I definitely didn't see anything move. There was some shadow, some stuff. So, you know, to, to be fair, I I didn't see the exact location of the shots because we didn't quite get there because I just didn't have time. And uh, so I didn't get to analyze any of that stuff. But just kind of talking with him, I felt like he wanted to see Bigfoot was kind of my impression. Right. Um, he wanted to see Bigfoot. And that's what he that's what was kind of coming out. Right. And when we got there, uh, I'm a very down to business guy. So I had him talk about it on recording. And then when we were done with that, um, we started to go and I stopped him because I could kind of recognize where he, I, I kind of had the overhead shots and was studying it the night before. So I kind of had some general idea of where he was taking these videos from. Mm -hmm. So the first one, which I had seen was the one where it was kind of near the, the waterway there. Yep. And I asked, I go, I, you know, why don't you take me to where the waterway is? Cause that would have been the closer one. And I knew that from looking at the overhead map and curiously, he said, Oh, that's, that's way down there. So I'm like, okay, so we're stuck with this tour. And he showed us some tracks, which were actually deer tracks. Were they the inline tracks that were like two feet apart in the snow? And, you know, he did say that he remembers seeing them shuffle on the ice. So that's why the tracks were probably not five feet apart. Yeah. But when we said those are deer tracks, he automatically turned around and said, oh, oh yeah, they're deer. No, no. Right. No. We go down and further. He shows us where he shot the first video. You know, I'm leaning on this rock and it's steady my camera. Yada, mm -hmm. yada, yada. And I'm looking, I'm going, I see nothing but trees on the other side of the, the waterway there. They, this doesn't look like the shot. And we continue on. And I turn around and ask him, I said, well, where is the, uh, the shot from that one where it was standing on the water edge? Oh, that was back there where you came in from. I was like, huh? Story. Yeah. Right. So all of a sudden we get to a certain point and he's afraid of this albino Bigfoot all of a sudden. Well, there's an albino Bigfoot, and he's mean, and he was, you know, showing us trail cam picture, alleged trail cam pictures. He said that we're 15 foot up in the air, and see that little white spot? That's the albino. And we were like, oh, okay. we're all starting to look at each other very cross-eyed. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, so he says, oh, I got to go, and he leaves us. He goes, you guys can go in further if you want. And we all looked at each other. Well, no need for us to go in any further. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So we start turning around, walking out, and lo and behold, we find the spot of the video that that first video he shot. And it was Is nowhere. that the one that got everybody's attention on um a BR faux page? Uh I do not know which know which one it was per se that got I everybody's think, attention. Uh, there, was there was so one, many he was blow he was sending them right. to us, and we I I honestly I didn't even have time. It was happened so quick. It right. really did. It happened. Like I said, I was close, right. so it was hard to even break down what, right. it was, what it was, was going it was, on. Yeah. It was the crouched one. Okay. Okay. It was the crowd one that was crouched watching him. And oh, this Bigfoot's been following me and it's crouched down there. And there it is. We can see what he was looking at. And we, we looked at it and, and there's a picture of me pointing at it. And Alex filmed me talking about it. And it's there. There it is. Now that's the Bigfoot right there. It's just a stat. It's some kind of natural formation, whether it be a bush or a pile of, of, of debris. And it was nowhere near. Uh, well, it was probably about 30 feet from the rock. So if you were standing at the rock, you couldn't see these things. Only okay. from the angle we were standing, you could see it. You can see the same ground that he was standing on. You could see the same ground. Right. So this is the shot right here. Why did he tell us he took it from there? And the story of him steadying his camera on the rock, right. he would have never seen it. So th at that point, I began to think, and, and I had uh, a night to think about it. Mm -hmm. Yep. And there's Alex who was with us. And um, I think I can run the video. Um, 
So this is some of the video that was shot that day where we were. Um, and uh, that debris line, I think, is a little bit uh, to the left now. And he was shooting on the other side of the river. So that's just a quick 4K shot of the... the um, yeah, and it was a it was a it was a weird little area too because he was telling me that was an island. It was an island. It was an island. That's all I heard. And then at the very end, before my phone went out, I was able to pull up Google Earth and get enough reception to kind of see that it wasn't an island. It was a peninsula and a floodplain. Right. Um, and then it was an airstrip down at the other end and probably limited access. Um, some farms, some more corn or something like that was kind of grown over there. And then and then the power lines. So it seemed to be open, a very big open space with a very limited tree line. Um, right. It, it wasn't a heavily forested area. It, it was for surrounded. even like big game, like bears, I don't know that maybe they come. I, I don't know. I don't know. I didn't see much sign other than like some deer and maybe some coyote. Bobcat. Yeah, yeah. Coyote, something. bobcat, coyote, yeah. like that. Um, well, uh, Steve, I mean, I don't, I don't want to get you to spill your report, but are you, you kind of leaning towards that this guy, do you think this guy may have seen something initially and then got Bigfoot on the brain or he just had Bigfoot on the I, brain in the beginning? <laughs> I, I don't think so. And the reason why I don't think so is people that have Bigfoot on the brain won't lie, won't mislead you. You know, I have this they whole... They tell you something they actually right. believe. Right, right. right. He is conforming the story um, to... Like, we believe he left us because he knew that on the way back we would see that area. That's what we were speculating at first. That, did he leave us because he knew we would find the actual spot? Um, and then the next day he has another group come out, too. So that's somebody that's looking to either. I, I don't. I, yeah, I'm not sure if he just well, likes the yeah. attention. If that's he just what we kind of got it. out of it, and we yeah. we had kind of my my partner Kelly had mentioned that night before we even left. He's like, Mike, I don't know. We're wasting our time over here because we wanted to bring a you know crew. We had some guys that were interested in going to walk through the woods with him. Um, we're like, okay, maybe we'll put a camera crew together, talk to people around town, see what they've heard, we'll see what right. they know. Uh, make it part of our adventure. You know, we did some local guys looking for Bigfoot. You know, we didn't think much of it other than that. Um, so Kelly was kind of on to it. And he's like, Mike, I'll play along. Well, he said, I'll, I'll what do he say? He told me that he would um, entertain me to come back at another date when, whenever we could work that out. We, and we didn't have any anything set in stone. Um, it was a Wednesday, I think, Wednesday evening. And we kind of, communication kind of fell apart a little bit and then we heard that he was dropping off didn't want anything to do with us we heard stories that we were intimidating and we heard stories that other investigators and networks were in in intimidating him and it was like a lot of lot of stuff and it almost i think maybe this goes a little bit what you were saying steve he seemed very um what's the word i'm looking for very open to he said he changed his mind a lot to cater what we were doing, and he just—I don't know, maybe the exact. He, you know, you know, they're, they're to he's me, impressionable, definitely. Like, I don't know. He's, well, I think I don't think he's impressionable. I think he's, and sometimes as a, a forensic interviewer, I will ask somebody a leading, and when I suspect they're lying and they're this type of suspect. I or this time of subject, I should say, they I will ask leading questions to get them to agree with it, even though I know they're completely wrong. Right, I got gotcha. you. You follow me, and that I will gotcha. tell me if this guy is trying to either please me, because I haven't done anything to make him impressionable. Right, right, right. What he's doing, I mean, if we had sat there and interrogated him for five hours, yeah, he may just end up telling us what we want to know. Right. But when we're sitting there and he's willingly taking us and very happily taking us, um, you know, you can throw a suggested, you know, thing out. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it, it, he would agree to it real quick. Um, I think that there was just too many lies he was making to call it 
this is just somebody that's sick. I mean, this starts with the ill family member. Well, if you okay. have an ill family, okay. right? Remember yeah, that? Yeah, 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 yeah. That was but, part of the but, whole, right? That was because that was part of the reason that, that why that he was Ill, shutting down and locking up and not talking right. to anybody. And was, that ill family member, w- w- and that ill family member is probably not going to make it, and they're on life support or whatever. But yet he had time to show you guys. He had time to t- show us. He has time to show somebody else the next mm-hmm. day. And his, a lot of times, his child was with him. Well, yeah. who's at the hospital? Yeah. You know, when is he going to the hospital? You know, it just made no sense. And right. then the, the accusations that you guys were bullies. The yeah. accusation that, you know, apparently Moneymaker was bullying him. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The accusation that, oh, another group was bullying him. Nobody was bullying him. Yeah, I, I, I honestly think yeah, we kind of came to the conclusion that he was looking for the attention. Um, to because we found a video of him claiming to be uh, Bigfoot bounty hunters, and they were locking and loading their guns because right. they found a Sasquatch on the mound or something, and yes. and that's when we're kind of like, okay, we. we and before that, what was he? He was, he was trying go. to be. He was trying to be a ghost hunter, and he was yes, taking yeah, picture he of ghosts. He and did, then he, yeah. oh, here's a picture of a UFO I got, and it's very clearly that from the inside of the vehicle that was a reflection. In fact, I think he used that same reflection because the next day he sent a trail cam picture of the crystal that had red glowing eyes. No okay. kind, and it did not look like real red glowing eyes. We've all sounds seen more, it. This sounds more and more like a guy looking for a uh, a TV show or something. Could be. Well, that's that's the thing that we were thinking was like, is he trying to get our attention? Is he how long? You know, this one guy, um, and I, I don't know if he's listened, but Richie, uh, Richie B down in Massachusetts has a podcast, uh, Banter with Richie B, and he yep, was talking to him for a little bit. Um, and, you know, the, the guy told him that he was a big fan of him for a while. So then we were kind of thinking, yeah. like, what's kind of going on here? Is he leading us because he thinks that, you know, we're famous? We're, I'm just starting out here, you know, and you guys show up. Okay, that that's his. Okay, he's he's yeah. getting what he wants. He's going through everybody. Right. Everybody's getting everybody's attention. And then um, even as it was, he had some other guys out there, too. So he was just he was and- going through the motions, trying to find friends, I think. In a way, you know what I mean? On top of, I think, pretty much what you just explained. And at looking at all the other stuff that he did, like the, the UFO pictures and then the, the ghost pictures, which could probably easily, easily be explained. I think he was just trying to gain provenance. You know, uh, to say, hey, look at me. I'm, you know, I do all this and yeah, continue yeah, to roll yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What he didn't realize was that after a while, people are going to say, okay. We, 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 you know, you've told one tale too many. Goodbye. Well, for a split second, I'm thinking like, okay, here we are, New Hampshire Bigfoot Society, um, and we just uncovered and have access, unfeathered access to the most prolific Bigfoot hunter of all time. Right. <laughs> right. You know, that's at first, that's the first impression. Okay, we got to get over and check this out because even if it's you know, a hunch is a hunch or a lead is a lead, right? You, you, yeah. you got to kind of fall follow right. the, the nice guy nice oh yeah guy. super nice not guy he's really not... cool um yeah totally i definitely I mean, have to throw that out there he's a nice and like, he's a like, really good guy everybody looked at me and said oh we're so sorry steve you drove you know two hours to come out here to, to look at that and i'm like it's all part of the job yeah. it's just the job you know and you walk away with it saying okay we now we know we don't have to sit there and say you know because if we didn't go we'd be saying what if what if yeah. well yeah. now we know yeah and we talked uh i think one of the nights before um and i had told you that we'd been there and how i and I, I expressed to you how yeah. us being new you know myself at least being new um i did i didn't want to be the reason why uh an investigation got botched either you know i didn't want to i and that's, i still feel that way with a, a lot of stuff that's why i think i want to develop a team of our own um, that's sure. capable of handling things and looking at things the right way, understanding how to approach it. Like you said, like a crime scene, um, how to, how to do all that stuff. Right. So we, one, 
don't get caught up any drama from third, fourth, fifth party things coming at me from all different directions and not knowing who's what yeah. and what's what and who's up and who's down. Um, because I was thinking, like, what did I get myself into? This is With, not yeah. this is not what I wanted. I wanted to make friends so, and, and shake so, hands and so Mike, how long was it that it took you to realize this guy was full of baloney? Um it didn't take me long at all um, walking with him because of he was pointing things out. There it is. There it is. And I clearly could not see. There was, there was sounds that were, um, he, he was afraid. We got to get out of the woods. There it is. There's a sound. There's a sound. I said, nope, let's walk toward the sound. And sure enough, there was two pine trees rubbing, you right. know, stuff like that. So um, yeah. it, it, by time but, I, you know, it got dark and we walked back. We kind of, I kind of had that vibe. Yes, um, he he I didn't, saw he saw a shadow across the river too with us as well. We didn't see yeah, anything. So. Yeah, but um, and then he was apologizing. Like I said too, he then he was apologizing. Oh, I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have brought anybody out. I shouldn't have said anything. It's like I feel bad for bringing you out here. We didn't see it, so it's like mm, okay, no worries, no yeah, worries, bud. Yeah, We're here. Yeah. It's all good. You know, um, to me, uh, you know, okay, uh, I was meeting, I was talking to him a little bit, not really about anything in particular. Uh, it wasn't until we sat down and started talking to him, and I knew within the first three minutes of talking to him about his experiences, he was full of beans. Yeah. Because he started off with, when did, it, of course, I, I have a regular, well, tell me about when this first started. Well, about a year ago, and at that point I knew, because he had never mentioned anything else. Yeah. Now that you say that, it does make sense because he said it happened at some time ago, but he wasn't into Bigfoot. Bigfoot was a new thing just the last couple of days that he got into. And I looked back and he had joined our group within a few days and he started posting all that stuff like right off the bat. Um, so that was kind of uh, a flag too um for me and now that you say that yeah that that makes sense so i think lester may be actually be familiar with the story did you find red markers lol and the ant to answer that question yes we did and we're going to we're, we're in the process of identifying what those red markers actually were um, we believe that there is some sort of guard that's on a snowmobile. Maybe wrong, but we're, we're going to find out what they are. So the tackle tactician says guys like him just create more skepticism, cause researchers to look over true. No, uh, to me, no, it doesn't. Every case needs every case needs to be looked at, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this guy doesn't turn me off to going after or give me right. a bias towards other research. Remember, um, remember, um, I write a lot about. Uh, I have a, a big, whole new experience with bias now. Is that you know I'm very hyper aware of bias, including my own. That when I look at something that I can't go in, I often say I go into things as a skeptic. I can't because being skeptical is a bias. Right. A yeah. lot of people don't realize I have to go in. Okay. As an investigator, I'm here to investigate what this is. Mm -hmm. Listen to the person's claims. Then you can become skeptical or go, Hey, this guy seems like he's telling the truth. I looked at him and yeah, he, he was telling, it looked like to me, he was a very artful at, hiding his body language as far as telling the stories but his stories were so all over the place and you know once you start mentioning something that doesn't seem credible and tell me about something that wasn't initially reported then i have an issue and uh that is huge um so do we want to take a 30 second commercial break here chris because i have something to play please go ahead
Yeah, that's right. We're just uh, probably about two months out before that book is going to be released. It is finished. Nice. And, and uh, it is uh, being examined by a couple of people I highly respect. Actually, three people I highly respect. We, we do know who one of them is. It's that guy sitting right there. Oh, really? Oh, you I, I, copy. I, I did send it to you, didn't I? Yeah, I got it. Oh, okay, okay. Because, you know, being off all my days and nights kind of run together now. Yeah. Some days I can't sleep because this wakes me up. So if I get up at three in the morning, I'll start working on videos. Um, just to keep my mind off it. But yep, that's coming out in uh, just a couple of months. So, and uh, I had to move my schedule up to events because I'm doing a charity event in, um, I'm not quite sure when, but I know it's June 1st. So I'll be out there, you know, stiff as a board, looking around at people. Lester said, Chris looks surprised. Yeah, Lester, yeah. I don't require respect. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just mean. So that's my fourth book. Nice. Wait I don't know if I don't know it's it's gonna be a while before the fifth. <laughs> but um, you know, a uh, very interesting topic. So I, I you know, I, I understand uh and even writing it even helped me understand better because to me, writing is a learning experience. I take sure. that journey. I'm the first one to take the journey that you're all gonna take to who gets the book. Yep. And uh hopefully my summations will make sense and and are worthy they do um i don't know how how far you've gotten into it chris but we'll talk I'm not, not very far um but uh we're now oh, we got about 18 minutes left to show already i mean that's how fast the, the two hours is gone oh wow that's good wow. yeah it's like we're almost fun. done we're we're in the home stretch here so, Steve, if you don't mind me asking you as a professional investigator, um, if you don't mind walking me through like some of the stuff. If you get a call or a lead, how how do you go through that? Especially something like with Matt Moneymaker um, in the BRFRO. Um, how does how does how do you guys well, do your thing? Well, as far as the BFRO is concerned, they get a report on their system when somebody reports it. They fill mm -hmm. out a form. Uh, same with me. If you go to my website, there's a form. You fill it out. I get notified. I look at the form. Um, Pat Collins said, I started with Steve, but, but with crayons, I can't stay within the lines. <laughs> Love you, Pat. Um, so you take a look at that report. Then you actually phone contact them if you can. And you have them describe the incident to you then you hopefully can arrange a face-to-face -face meeting again have them you know and hopefully both times you're recording those mm -hmm. then you can take one two and three and if they all coalesce that's when you start moving into the field research portion of it we're going to look around we're going to collect some evidence what type of sighting is it is it uh, a territorial type of mm -hmm. sighting which hey you might be on to something there is it an activity type of assignment like okay we, we saw it by the side of the pond drinking water or pulling weeds or something like right. that or is it just like a roadside crossing because in a roadside crossing the chances of it coming back there in the same spot kind of slim right. so you're going to look around find evidence see if you can track something for a distance or whatever and that's how the investigation start from there it goes on to whatever you're finding as, as far as evidence. Right. And then just following the leads and. Yep. And, and yeah. You might want to talk to the neighbors. One of the things I always talk about in, uh, in uh, the Sasquatch playbook, which is my third book is finding that secondary witness. And what a secondary witness is, all right, this guy was out driving his car home. He sees a big foot walk by. He was amazed by it, drives home. You always want to build the timeline of that drive too. Well, when did you leave this place? Did you stop anywhere? No. Okay. And then drive it yourself. See if his timeline makes sense. Right. These are just little things. You want to check the weather data. Make sure the weather's correct for the, the, the type. Because I'm going to ask things that you can 
um, verify and check. verify that are yeah. verifiable. We want to take anything you can get verifiable because that's either going to break your case or it's going to make the case more credible. The secondary witness is, you know, well, did you tell anybody? Well, when I got home, I told my wife and she kind of laughed at me, yada, 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 or whatever. Let's say that happened. Mm -hmm. Well, can I talk to your wife? And their openness to what you talk to the wife could be a, a big indicator. Well, I don't want I don't want to involve anybody else. Okay. Right. The secondary witness can say, Oh, yeah, I I remember that night he came home, he was all jumped up, he was excited, you know, he couldn't believe what he had seen. Ah, now you're getting corroboration that's making the case okay. more credible. Sure. Right? Yeah. And a lot of people forget to do that. I remember there was a woman who was on the uh, uh, the uh, on the uh, monster quest that I had done, Sue Ross. And Sue Ross was about five or six years old when she had seen a juvenile Sasquatch actually throwing rocks, was throwing rocks at her brother that was jumping up and down. And the brother thought she was throwing the rocks. And she ran home and the brother's yelling at her and she was telling her mom what had happened. And sure enough, we interviewed the mother. Oh, I remember her coming home. And yeah, she was all hopped up. She said she saw this little monkey out there jumping up and down throwing rocks at, you know, her brother. And it wasn't her that did it, but it was this, she took a lie detector and she passed. So, but you have that secondary witness corroboration. And that's why that becomes important to build your story up. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, to build the credibility of a case up. If they have resistance to that, you know, you try to probe a little bit. Why? Well, why do you have resistance to that? You know, why? Why don't you? This helps. We won't have to mention her name, but this helps build credibility to your right. case. Yeah. And if they still don't want to do it, because usually, a person who sees a bigfoot, what do they want? What's their number one thing they want? Vindication. So they'd be like, sure, talk to my wife. She can tell you. Well, you know, yeah. I, I'm not bullshitting you about this. Right? So that's why it becomes very, very important. So that's my that's my tips of how to do, you know, how to start. And the rest is all field work and tools and stuff you can buy and making yourself a good forensic evidence collection kit. You know, buy yourself some de tubes that you can put buckle swabs in, buy yourself some buckle swabs, buy yourself some rubber, uh, you know, late uh, mm -hmm. uh uh, not rubber gloves now they're all um uh whatever they can buy yourself yeah. some, some plastic or something yeah uh, yeah yeah i know what you're talking about yeah yeah buy yourself some gloves buy yourself some fingerprint powder buy yourself a brush buy yourself some tape to lift it buy yourself some cards to put them on truth be known that if you find more than one print handprint on something print one and swab the other with the buckle swab because those oils that are released contain DNA now, and DNA has gotten as good to actually identify the DNA in a fingerprint. Hmm, so that's important to remember. Same thing with a footprint. You get a footprint, you get a trackway, and you're going to cast, but leave one trackway that you're going to buckle swab it. Buckle swab the whole thing. You may pick up some oils from their feet as they come down. You look for hairs and mm -hmm. tracks. You look for hairs anywhere it touches. You look for hairs on nearby trees. So there, there's a bunch of things that you can do forensically. Mm -hmm. you always wear your gloves. Even wear a COVID mask sometime, a good right. old mask. Um, that way you're not breathing or contaminating the evidence in front of you by breath. Right, so, right. right. So and, you, and that's you true. You have uh, a book. Probably, you Shelly oh, Covington, Shelly Covington, Montana sells those kits. Shelly's a great girl. Okay. She is so down to earth, real good, good. She's from Texas, a really good, excellent researcher. Yeah. So I was going to ask you. You said your book, your third book, or one of your books was the was it? You said it was the Bigfoot Playbook, Sasquatch Playbook, Sasquatch Playbook. Does that have a lot of that stuff in it? Some of it, yes. Investigation. Yep. Out of your resources, which which one would you recommend for me to uh, start off with? Truthfully, I would start with the last one first. Okay. Because that explores. Is it, the, you mean the one that's coming out? The one that's coming okay. out. Okay. And the reason why that kind of explores what goes through a person mind, a person's mind, not only in a sighting, but in a hoax and in a misidentification and Bigfoot on the brain and okay. their post reactions and how, how they act afterwards. 
that gives you all some insight on what to look for and what not to look for. And that's where so, I think we're going to work on here in New Hampshire Bigfoot Society. Uh, you know, Kelly has some experience with it. Um, we ha- yeah. he ha- he's actually been talking with Crystal Pendick. Um, very good, very good, very good. And we're going to kind of maybe co- collaborate, do some training with them. I know the people from Maine, uh, Maine Bigfoot Foundation, um, eager to kind of share some knowledge too. And one and- one of our one of our guys, Don Gum- uh, Don Gumow, is in chat. Uh, he may still be in chat. You might want to hook up with him. His name is Don Gumow Jr. You might okay. want to hook up with him. He's main Bigfoot research. Okay. <clears throat> um, so, and you might want to hook up with the guys from Squatchachusetts as well. They're also BR4O affiliated as yeah, well. Yeah, we're actually going to do an event, um, just to plug a couple events, um, on June 22nd, I believe, the weekend, that weekend anyway, um, over at Charming Fair Farm in Candy, New Hampshire, we will be setting up a tent in a booth and doing all kinds of fun stuff. As long as I know Squatch Choose is going to be there. Um, I know Banter with Richie B is going to be doing his podcast from there. And there's a whole lot of other people coming in and it's going to be fun. It's a scouting with Bigfoot um, event in June in Candy, New Hampshire, which is in southern New Hampshire. So it's not too far off the beaten path at all. And then if you guys are up for it and want to want to really go outside your, your realm for a little bit, uh, tickets are also on sale for the Pennsylvania camp, uh, P- Pennsylvania camping, uh, Pennsylvania Bigfoot camping adventure, which is down in Fayette County, Pennsylvania, which is in the southeastern or southwestern corner of uh, Pennsylvania. Great area. The Chestnut Ridge, if you've heard about the Chestnut Ridge, surrounds that area. Really, really good stuff. And that was so, done by Eric Altman. Yep. Okay. I've seen a lot of Pennsylvania stuff. Um, yeah, trying to put faces and names together. Yeah. There's so much stuff going on. It's actually really cool. Yeah. I know, um, was it Dan Benoit down at ECBRO was doing some events down in Virginia and I think Pennsylvania. Um, and yeah, I'm trying to. Trying to find out what we're going to have ours in October. Like I said, Portland, the cryptozoology thing is in in um, April. And, that, and, that, and that's up. true. And that's true, too. There, uh, You want to hook up with Vermont as well. Okay. Yes. We forget about Vermont, New Hampshire. No offense, guys. It's kind of a joke with us. We, the best part of Vermont is the view in New Hampshire. Hey, but but just be careful. Beware of Sasquatch researchers in Vermont. Okay, seeing seeing porcupines and claiming they're juvenile Bigfoot. Now oh. comes the part where we throw our heads back and laugh. Ready? Ready! Ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, sorry, folks. Had to go there. <laughs> now Pat Collins said Vermont. Hey, good night, Mike, and thank you again, brother. Pat Collins says Vermont is the thanks, Mike. The Vermont is the woodchuck state. But how much wood could a woodchuck chuck? If a woodchuck uh, how, could chuck. Wood. How, how much squatch can a Sasquatch squatch if a Sasquatch <laughs> could squatch Sasquatch? <laughs> Try that one. Uh, uh uh, gonna have to come out with a limerick book next, Steve. Hell a no. book of Sasquatch limericks. <laughs> St. Patty's Day, right? There oh, once was a squ- <laughs> there once was a squatch from the oh, man, tuck it. <laughs> he's got the he's got the Bigfoot album. The Bigfoot album. You've got that on the site now, right? You know, you know what's gonna happen if I finish that? <laughs> Enjoy the band. <laughs> Yes, that's oh, why we, we can't we we can't finish it. Uh, Are you doing some music? Huh? Are you doing some Bigfoot music? Yeah. Is Not that what the, the album? No? Yeah. Oh, actually I am, yes. Yeah. But uh, you know, now I think about it. Um uh we have a report from the Canadians. Oh. That's a nine footer. I knew those c- were real. <laughs> yeah, we can't, 
We can't forget Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. They're up there too. Yes, they, for, they, they, they have the Sam Squanch out there. <laughs> yes, yeah, Sam Squanches. <laughs> Oh man, I hadn't saw that episode, but Steve showed me a clip of it. Yes, those guys are when they captured the Sam Squatch. It's it's hilarious. Yeah. Which which one though? You haven't seen the other one. Oh, I, saw, I saw yeah. the one where he was peeking in his shed. Yeah, and, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. When was it Julian came out with a blanket and uh, yeah, 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 yeah. He was oh, watching. Yeah, and then yeah, those guys are great. I love yeah. that kind of hue. That just kind of Canadian humor just lights me up. It's fun. It's it's almost like it's relatable for me, you know, being a northern New Englander. We're more, I feel more connected with Canadians than I do the rest of America, to be honest with you. But that's what is what it is. Yes. So we, we try to have a little fun here now. We're wrapping okay. up. But anyway, it's that time to wrap up, Chris. But I first want to thank Mike for coming on tonight. It's been fun. Thanks so and, much. It was my and, pleasure. And very, you know, believe it or not, you have a lot of insight for being in this field for that bit six so, months yeah but keep it up you. keep thank it up you. and thank and again i'm here as a resource i can hook you up with some uh, you know and i'm really looking great forward to that too. Yeah. yeah so all right chris do your and thing like, likewise i want to thank mike for coming on with us we've enjoyed having you thank you so much a pleasure and honor to have you good good conversation always love a good conversation uh i want to thank everybody over in chat all our faithful listeners in our chat recipients there or chat participants and if you've been hanging out and kind of like lurking and not chatting we still appreciate you we know you there but we appreciate you uh, if it's your first time listening first time watching on youtube don't forget to hit the subscribe button and you know you guys in the chat make sure you punch that like button on the way out it helps us and sure we appreciate everybody just listening on the podcast wherever you may be and i know there's a bunch of them but we we certainly appreciate you always remember step by or stop by the, the channel at squatch dtv on youtube to catch out some of the video features if you've been listening to the sound you know check out some of the video but yep. uh, we appreciate you we're, we're honored that you spend your time with us and uh you know can't wait to do it again thank you and on behalf of everybody here, we want to thank, again, thank you to our wonderful audience. We love you guys. You guys are the best audience in the world. Thank you, Mike Waldy, as well, for your generous contribution. And thank you also, uh, was it Wal Walter? Yes, Walter, buying the five Walter. memberships. Yeah, yes, thank sir. you so much. Uh, we appreciate that. New members, if you know you got a gift membership and you like what you see, stick around because... Uh, we were always doing stuff with that. And in fact, another uh, 10 days, I believe, we're going to be doing the um, the next seminar on for the members only. So uh, more stay tuned. That, that's that's going to be fun. And we got a lot more stuff coming. Uh, I'm sorry it's been a little bit slow, but I've been going to medical treatment every other day. I got to go to medical treatment tomorrow for this thing and uh, see where I'm at with work. Because as you know, I work in EMS, so lifting people around is not really right now. I'm not sure if it's in my wheelhouse or not. We're gonna have to test it out. So um anyway, on behalf of me and everybody else here, again, thanks, Mike. And we want to wish everybody a happy, safe, healthy week. We will catch you all this Friday night, 9 p.m. Eastern on the Bigfoot News. We already have a couple stories stacked for that already. It's gonna be a fun time. And uh, hey, everybody, we'll catch you all in a bit. We thank you for being here with us on Squatch DTV. If you haven't taken the time yet, please hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. And oh yes, hit that notification bell too. We don't want you to miss anything. If you really like our content, you should consider becoming a member. And it's really inexpensive and a great way to support not only the show, but Honest Bigfoot Research. Everyone have a great week. Be safe and God bless. We will see you all here next time on Squatch DTV. Keep on squatching.